Me and you, Jaguar, we're going places. I sure have my work cut out for me this time. Hey everybody, it's your old pal Mike. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe. And on the bench today, I've got this fantastic brand new CV Squire Jaguar. This is a fantastic model that I, I really do have a lot of positive things to say about. However, I will admit that this thing plays pretty poorly from the factory. It is not an ideal playing experience, let's put it that way. This thing does not stay in tune. I have tuned it over and over and over again, and even when I'm not touching the bar, the cut of the nut is so poor that the strings are binding. If I play an aggressive chord, it goes straight out. We've got rattles and sitar noises galore. We've got an incredibly dry Indian laurel fretboard. The strings will not stay in place because the neck doesn't have the appropriate amount of pitch back, and so the bridge is not high enough to get the downward force from the strings that it needs. And also the strings are nine gauge, so that's, that's also working against us. And we've got a noisy vibrato. That's not gonna work for anybody, especially my pal Ryan, who bought this guitar based on my recommendation. And it's true, I have so many Wonderful things to say about the Squire CV. I really do love them. But yes, factory setup leaves much to be desired. And it boggles my mind so much that I get Galron eyes just thinking about it. Woof. <laughs> so the game plan for today's episode is to bring you along for the ride as I tackle each and every one of these issues. And at the end of everything, I will have a guitar that plays better, that sounds better, that stays in tune better, and a guitar that will further encourage my friend Ryan to continue on his musical journey wherever that path takes him. I have indeed done some videos on Jazzmaster and Jaguar setup in the past, and you can find those videos on my channel, I will link to them down below, but I believe the true test of the concepts laid forth by what I consider to be Leo Fender's most brilliant and misunderstood designs is when you apply those same concepts to a cheap guitar like the Squire CV. This is an import, it's made to be affordable, some of the hardware is not so great, but it can be made better with just a little bit of attention. And that's exactly what I plan to do today. So why don't you buckle up, pull down your lap bar, keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times, and together let's find out what exactly we need to do to improve this great Squire Classic Vibe Jaguar. First thing I'm gonna do is take the strap off because it's always easier to work on instruments without the strap. Word to the wise, and to myself. Try not to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate the kind of pitch back that I have on this neck because the bridge, as you can see, is completely slammed straight into the body. There's no height on it, and if I wanted to lower the action, well, I just can't. Not without pitching the neck back. So, let's have a look. Now, just by looking at it, I can already tell that there is absolutely no pitch back on this neck. The bridge is completely flat against the body, and if I wanted to lower the action, well, I'm out of luck. But to help illustrate the point, I often use a straight edge just to give me more of an idea of how parallel the neck is with the body. And yeah, there's pretty much no pitch back at all on this guitar. Now you can see that the strings really don't take a lot of encouragement to pop out of their saddle slots, even though the slots are much deeper than on the threaded saddle Jazzmaster bridge. And this is because there just isn't enough downward force on the bridge to hold them in place. So what we're going to do is we're going to install a shim in the neck and pitch it upward so that the bridge can be raised and thus more downward force will be created. This will also have the added benefit of stopping a lot of the errant buzz and rattles that come from this bridge when there just isn't enough downward force. And while I'm at that, I'm going to take the neck off, make some preliminary adjustments for the much heavier strings that we are going to put on this. Ernie Ball, Power Slinky, 11 to 48. I'm also going to oil the fretboard and polish the frets because I cannot, in good conscience, give it back to my friend Ryan in the state that it is currently in. This just won't do. Why don't we get to that? All right, let's take these strings off. All right and cut because we are not going to be saving these strings at all.
while I'm here, I may as well take this plastic off the vibrato, which is a relatively new thing that Fender's been doing. Next, I'm going to remove the bridge and check the fit of the screws for height adjustment in the bridge posts and... Can you hear that? They are loose, so we are going to add some Loctite to those threads to gunk them up a little bit so that when it comes time to string up and play test, the bridge is not going to sink on us as we strum away. So I'm going to apply some Loctite to these threads as I have done in the past, just a little bit. You don't need a whole lot, just enough to fill up the gaps between the screws and their receptacles or whatever that is called. And we're just gonna dab up a little bit of the excess and then screw them back in just a little bit. Yeah, that already feels quite a bit better. And we'll just wipe up the excess here and probably back them out again because I know that I'm gonna want this bridge a lot higher so I may as well have them poking out a little bit more for later. And while I'm here, all of these screws felt a little loose. I feel pretty solid actually. I may come back and apply Loctite to the intonation screws as well. I'm just eyeballing where I think the intonation points are gonna be based on how out of tune this thing was. But I just wanna make sure that these screws aren't going to rattle wildly when I put string tension on them. I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna put a little Loctite on these screws. So what I'm gonna do is back the saddles considerably farther than I think I'm going to need them and pop a little Loctite on the threads. You don't need a lot to do the job because it will wick naturally into the holes. And if you put too much on like I just did, up into the saddle slots as well. Now this stuff does dry clear so you don't have to worry about it looking blue for all eternity, but it's a good idea to still wipe away the excess. Make sure you don't have any in the slot where the string is gonna go. And then we're just gonna back the saddles further up onto the screw posts. I mean, do I win a prize if I guess intonation? I just lost $10 to myself. And all the excess is wiped off, so I'm just gonna let that chill over here with the other parts I've removed. Let that simmer and dry. Fender put plastic on the vibrato and some of these fingerprints that are already on here feel like they don't wanna come off, so may as well give it a quick wipe down while I'm here and see if I can make that better. Yeah, it was pretty dirty. Lots of fingerprints. I wonder if this came from a shop where they attempted to set it up and left a bunch of fingerprints on it, or maybe, I don't know, maybe that's presumptuous. Maybe this is all just Ryan enjoying his new guitar. Yeah, for a vibrato that had plastic all over it, it's like, that's pretty grubby. That's, that's weird. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna mark up the vibrato again anyway, because I'm going to uh, dismantle it and fix some things about it. In fact, we may as well do that first. Let's get to the good stuff here. Just gonna have a look at the fit of the arm and its collet. Pretty good. A Little bit of movement. Might do the hammer trick on that. We'll see how I feel later on, but the real the real pressing issue, I believe, is going to be, uh, ha, yes. So this right here is called the pivot plate, and it is a crucial part when it comes to the functionality of your offset vibrato. Specifically, these two little legs of the pivot plate are what lock in with the string anchor plate and allow it to pivot. And if I actuate it, you can hear it's clicking. And if you take a moment to inspect the pivot plate legs, you can see that the edges are not only rounded over, they're also very rough. And that means that the string anchor plate will shift around as you use the vibrato. The best way to address this is to remove the pivot plate and use something like a belt sander to flatten those edges. Now that I've got sharp, flush edges on the pivot plate, I'm gonna reinstall it and see what kind of difference that made. All right, got it reinstalled. Let's hear what we've got. Much better. Still some noise. 
And let's be honest, you're never gonna get rid of every single noise that comes from this vibrato. It's just not that high quality of a part. If you need a higher quality experience, go for a Fender AVRI vibrato, go for a Mastery, go for a Descendant, any of those options. It's just gonna be a better quality experience than this thing. Next thing I'm gonna do is remove the neck. And I'm impressed, this is actually a pretty tight neck pocket, so well done, Squire. Let's set this body, so oh, there is a shim in here. What the hell? Sandpaper is not something that I like to see from the factory, and you can tell from the placement of it, it really isn't doing a whole lot for pitchback either. At the very least, we should be covering this edge of the pocket with whatever shim material we use, and it's likely better to use a full pocket shim anyway. But this, that's not gonna cut it. To get the best experience here, we're gonna have to replace that with something a little more substantial, and I think I've got a spare Stumac shim. I do have... Stumac quarter degree pitch back. I don't know that it's gonna be enough. Let's see here. Clear out all the excess wood. Well, that's something at least. I wonder if I can pitch that back even more. The Stumac shim is actually kind of thick on this side, so I'm gonna shave it down just a little bit more. Shave it down to almost nothing on one edge. Let's see if that gives us better pitch back. And it does! Yep, that is a lot better, but I think we're gonna have to shim just a little bit more to get the most out of this guitar, so let's keep going. Now before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's clean up these frets and the fretboard. This is all so dry. And we're gonna go ahead and oil this too. Oh, a lot happier already. Super, super dry. Some good color in there. And the last thing I'm going to do to the neck is I'm going to tweak the truss rod just a little bit because I know that the 11 to 48 Ernie Ball Power Slinkies are gonna have a lot more tension on them than the nines that came on the guitar from the factory. Oh yeah, it's got plenty of turn. Try and get that pitched back just a little bit. There we go. That should be plenty. That fretboard's looking a lot better. All right, let's reattach to the body. All right, I've got the neck reattached, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna preemptively widen the nut slots. The nut was already pretty tight on the strings that were on there from the factory, and I know it's not gonna be happy when I try to put on 11 to 48. Uh, because I already know what gauges I'm putting on, I can choose the right file for the job. For the 48 gauge low E, I'm choosing the Stumac 50 gauge nut file. I'm just going to gently expand the slot and around the back edge. The nut slots are extremely high to begin with, so I think I've got plenty of room to work with. Normally I like to measure first, but these nut slots were so high to begin with, I'm just going to round the bottoms so that I have a good starting place. Moving on to 20 for the G. It's okay to go a couple gauges higher. Looks like this isn't even the original nut, actually. It looks like a bone replacement. Now that I've got the nut slots widened, I'm gonna string up. And in the case of Fender headstocks, I like to measure one, two, three tuners past the one that I'm tuning, which in this case is the low E, to ensure that I have enough wraps around the post for tuning stability and for downward pressure on the nut. Cut at the G tuner, insert the string inside the hole in the tuning shaft, and wind as normal. Always go down the shaft. Don't let the string ride up on you. That is plenty of height on that nut. We are going to have to adjust that later on. 
Same for the A, which means we cut at the B. And so on. All right, now the guitar is fully strung up and you can see I've got adequate pitch back on the neck. I've got adequate bridge height that's keeping the strings in place. And now with the extra work I did, the vibrato. is completely noise free. It really came out great, this one. The last few things I need to do are true up the nut slots to make sure that I'm getting the best possible playing experience, both in terms of height and also tuning stability. And from there, I need to fine tune the action and intonation, and then we are done. Overall, this went really great, and I am so pleased with where the guitar is now in terms of sound and playability. I really can't wait to plug back in and show you the difference that just a little bit of care makes. So yeah, let's finish that final stretch. Now the D feels good to me, so I think I'm gonna bring down the G, B, and E just a little bit for the sake of consistency. I'm just gonna lower the high E as my final stroke. It's important to work slowly and carefully. With the slots now cut properly, I think I'm gonna go the extra mile and just polish up that piece of bone for my friend Ryan. Uh, it is kind of chalky and looks unfinished. And look, I know this is a squire. I know that having me work on this is adding to the cost of the thing, but I, look, I just want this to be perfect for my buddy, uh, as I would any of my customers. So I'm just gonna go the extra mile and polish up this nut so that my friend Ryan can be proud of every single component of his guitar. I figure, why not? With the nut polished, all that's left is intonation. So let's get it done. It's always important to roll off the tone and select the neck or middle position if you possibly can. It makes it easier to set intonation. And that way with the tone rolled off, you're losing a lot of the higher harmonics that might confuse your tuner. Even something as fancy as the Peterson Strobo Stomp. Ah, I tuned it pretty well. Normally by ear, I tune uh, a half step down naturally, but this time, oh, I'm right there. I'm like three cents off. Well, yay for me. Also, I always make sure to intonate in playing position like this. With the guitar flat on its back like this, that little bit of force on the neck can actually throw your intonation points way off. So it's important to intonate only in playing position. You always want to intonate right on pitch. Play the harmonic of the 12th fret and compare the fretted note, which is flat. So I'm just going to move the saddle forward a little bit and then check again. All right, maybe that's better. Yep, yep. And B is a little bit flat as well. Mm-hmm. All right, now that I've finished the setup, I am chomping at the bit to hear what we've come up with. Let's check it out. So much better, so much better than it was. Now granted, these are new strings. They're gonna take a little time to break in.
-hmm. But the guitar is staying in tune really, really well. And it's also a lot more fun to play. I mean, earlier when I play tested it, I was not happy. I was not excited about it. Uh, and even though I could see the potential and I knew it could be a better guitar, ugh, sometimes that first playthrough is, um, well, it's an ordeal. And this was certainly one of those play tests. Let's hear how the other pickup positions sound. This is middle. Neck. Oh, and the strangle switch. And the rhythm circuit. Well, all in all, this thing came out great, and I cannot wait to put it back in Ryan's hands. I think he's going to be really pleased. This guitar is a testament to just how important it is to set up offset guitars the way that Leo Fender intended. That's with a pitched back neck, that's with some height on the bridge, and a substantial set of strings, tens or above, generally. Doing so all but ensures that your guitar is going to perform its best from vibrato to tuner. All you need to do is give it a little bit of attention. Now, as excited as I am to get it back in its owner's hands, well, we're not quite there yet. I'm gonna take a little bit more time with this one and then we're gonna do a review. That's right, Squire Classic Vibe Jaguar review coming up real soon. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate you coming back to the channel again and again. It means so much that you keep liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing, all of that good stuff. It really means the world to me. Well, I've got just a little bit more work to do on this one and I wanna take my time and play some cool tunes on it. So I'm gonna let you let me go. But in the meantime, I hope you're taking care of yourself and each other. I hope you're staying safe out there and we'll see you in the next one.